Today, Philosophy Insights did some special editing of Jordan Peterson's lecture, and I hope you enjoy the content. But I could comment more about borderline personality disorder. I think I have enough mental energy to do that tonight. So, <laughs> technically speaking, it's often considered the female variant of antisocial personality disorder. So it's, 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 it's classified, or it's classified in, in, in the domain of externalizing disorders, acting out disorders. And I think what happens, we don't understand borderline personality disorder very well. I mean, it's characterized by tremendous impulsivity, um, radical confusion of identity, um, and then this pattern of idealization of, of people with whom the person afflicted with the disorder is associating with radical idealization of those people and then radical devaluation of them. And then there's another theme that sort of weaves along with it, which is the proclivity of people with borderline personality disorder to presume that they will be abandoned and then to act in a manner that makes such abandonment virtually certain. And so, it's a very complicated disorder, but that, I think, gets at the crux of it. One of the things that's interesting about people with borderline personality disorder, in my experience, is that they're often quite intelligent. And you, you see in the person with borderline personality disorder something like the, the waste or the squandering of tremendous potential. They, they seem capable of thinking through the nature of their problems and analyzing them and discussing it, but not capable whatsoever of implementing any solutions. And <laughs> Technically, there's no relationship between I IQ and conscientiousness. It's very weird. Because if you read the neuropsychological literature, and you read about the functions of the prefrontal cortex, they're usually conceptualized in intellectual terms. And they're associated with planning and strategizing and so forth. And that's what conscientiousness is, is planning and strategizing and implementation. But the correlation between IQ and conscientiousness is zero. And so is the correlation between working memory and conscientiousness. Zero. And zero is a very low correlation, right? I mean, really, it's hard to find things in psychology that are correlated at zero. Things tend to be correlated to some degree. They tend to be interrelated. The borderline seems to be able to strategize and to abstract, but not to be able to implement. And, and so, this, the intellect per se seems to be functional, but it's not embodied in action. It's very, so it can be frustrating to be associated with someone who has borderline personality disorder because they can tell you what the problem is and even tell you what the solution might be, but there's no implementation. So maybe something went wrong developmentally. We don't know exactly how these sorts of things come about. The other thing that seems to be characteristic of borderline, people with borderline personality disorder is that they, they remind me very much of people who are two years old. And in some manner, like people with borderline personality disorder can have temper tantrums. In fact, they often do. And you know, now and then you see a temper tantrum and they're usually thrown by two-year-olds, right? Most people grow out of temper tantrums by the time they're about three. They're very rare at four, which is a good thing, because if they're still there at four, that is not a good diagnostic predictor. That's a, actually a good diagnostic predictor, but it's not the kind that you want. And, you know, it's funny the way that we respond to two-year-old temper tantrums, because the two-year-old will throw themselves on the ground and beat their hands and their legs on the floor and scream and yell and turn red or even blue. I, I saw a child once who was capable of holding his breath during a temper tantrum till he turned blue, which was really an impressive feat. You should try that, right? It's really hard. You really have to work at it. And you see that in adult borderlines. They'll have temper tantrums. And the funny thing is, when a two-year-old does it, it's like it's, you know, it's a little off-putting. But when an adult does it, it's completely bloody terrifying. And it, it happens very frequently with borderlines. And so, I would also say to some degree, they didn't get properly socialized between that critical period of development between two and four. 
And you see the same thing with adult males who grow up to be antisocial. Because a large proportion of adult males who grow up to be antisocial are aggressive as children, as two-year-olds. And so there's a small proportion of two-year-olds who are quite aggressive. They'll kick and hit and bite and steal if you put them with other two-year-olds. It's about 5% of the, of the males, smaller fraction of the females. But most of them are socialized by the time they're four. But there's a small percentage who aren't, and they tend to stay antisocial, and they tend to turn into long-term offenders. And, and, it, and the, develop, the critical period for socialization development seems to be between two and four. And it seems to be mediated by pretend play and rough-and-tumble play and those sorts of mechanisms. And if it isn't instantiated by the age of four, it doesn't happen. And it doesn't look like it's addressable. Now, there are dialectic behavior therapies that have been developed for people with borderline personality disorder. And they're purported to be successful. But... Okay, thank you. If I may, uh, so the second uh, psychological disorder I wanted to ask you about is uh, psychopathy. So you've mentioned that uh, psychopaths tend to switch from dominance hierarchy to dominance hierarchy because people get tired of their shenanigans and they have to move on to fresh people. Um, and psychopaths also tend to be very low in conscientiousness. And you said that when you see some of these protesters uh, at your speeches, uh, some of the men in particular uh, your your uh, clinical intuition tells you that there's something seriously pathological about them. And uh, I was wondering if you would suspect uh, that some of these men might be psychopathic as... Well, some of them likely are, but I don't know if a higher proportion of the ones who show up at protests and sort of creep me out are... I, I don't know if, if there's a higher proportion of people like that at the protests or not. I mean, I suspect in general that regardless of the protest, the proportion of people who have personality disorders among protesters is higher than the proportion of people who have personality disorders in the general population. Because you just expect that. You just expect that kind of acting out behavior. I'm not, believe me, I'm not saying that all protest is associated with personality disorder. I'm not saying that at all. There's plenty of reason for protest, but some of the reason for protests are credible reasons and some of them aren't yeah. credible reasons. And so I was just thinking that like the social justice hierarchy, so to speak, would be one of the last that these confused men... That's, that's, that's a different issue. You know, there are, there are analysis of the dangers of agreeableness. So agreeableness is a personality trait that underlies the radical egalitarian ethos because agreeable people want everything to be shared equally. And it's a good... I think it's a good ethos for a small group, for a family, because a family is kind of a communist system in some sense, right? It's like you want the food to be divided up equally among the children. Clearly, and you want all the children, sort of regardless of their inherent abilities, to have the same opportunities and perhaps even the same outcomes. So I think agreeableness, which is associated at least in part with maternal, maternal, the maternal instinct, let's say, maternal patterns of behavior, I think it's, uh, it's a good first-pass motivational approximation to a localized familial ethic. I think it's a catastrophe at larger scales. I don't think it scales at all. I actually think that's why we evolved conscientiousness. Because conscientiousness is the principle that allows larger scale organizations to exist. Agreeableness won't do it. Now, conscientiousness is a mystery, right? We don't have a neurological model. We don't have a conceptual model. We don't have an animal model. We don't have a pharmacological model. And we really only have one way of assessing it, which is self and other reports of personality proclivity. So, anyways, the problem with agreeableness, this has been modeled by game theorists, is that a population of cooperative people can be dominated by a single shark. So, agreeableness is insufficient as a principle because it opens itself up to, um, what do you call that, manipulation and... Man, man, manipulation, let's, let's leave it at that, to manipulation and, 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 and exploitation. That's the other thing, exploitation. So, thank you. Thank you.